Hi, I'm Meta Spencer. Let's go to Ottawa. I think uh, my guest is in Ottawa. We haven't met. We've uh, been in contact about 20 seconds. So we're going to get acquainted. And his name is Ole Hendrickson. He is an ecologist. And that's the kind of guy that we need more of. Uh, he was, uh, as I understand it, he worked for 30 some years for the government of Canada doing biodiversity uh, work uh, in forestry and agriculture. Have I got that right, Ole? Uh, pre pretty much. It was only 28 years. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> I'm actually in a, a little uh, place in um, on the Ottawa uh, the municipality of Illos Alumet. It's near Pembroke, Ontario. We're not in Ottawa today. <laughs> you are interested not only in biodiversity, but uh, the other reason that I was told to contact you was that you were concerned about and very knowledgeable and very active uh, in matters having to do with nuclear radiation and the exposure to radioactive risks. Um, I, I want to ask a, a question that you may or may not know the answer to, and that's really about the risk of um, radiation exposure in Ukraine now, because as I understand it, the Russians have taken control of Chernobyl and maybe some of the other 15 reactors in, uh, in Ukraine. Yeah, as... Um I'm uh, chair of the Conservation Committee of Sierra Club Canada Foundation, and, and we recently joined the international campaign against nuclear weapons, ICANN. So I've been looking at a lot of uh, posts about the risks um, in Ukraine of, of some releases of radiation. It's clear that when uh, the Russians moved heavy vehicles into the Chernobyl area. There was a fair bit of dust stirred up. So some of the contamination did get spread around further. Um, but all the Chernobyl reactors have been shut down, um, not just the, the, the one that had the serious meltdown, but all the others at that site for a number of years. So I don't think we'll see a problem, uh, hopefully not from those that reactor complex, but there are other reactors in Ukraine that, that people are concerned about as well. And of course, there's the whole thing about um, nuclear weapons being on high alert, uh, um, that, that announcement from um, uh, President Putin, and that's of great concern to the uh, disarmament community as well. Oh, absolutely. And I hear that the one in Zaporizhia is the largest one. And they were, somebody was this morning uh, expressing concern about it. I don't know why. Mm. You know, uh, is there any, I, I haven't read what they, what worries people most. Is it that they think that some people are going to take control of the you know, the instruments of uh, managing these things, uh, people who don't know what they're doing, or um, what's the main worry, do you know? I don't, but uh, what you just said, um, yeah, I, it takes some training and skill to be a reactor operator, and you don't just want the military to come in and have the ones who are running a reactor leave and then uh if it's that that does pose pretty serious risks yeah well if if that's what's happening but i haven't really heard no that, i haven't either I, I just made that up so i i don't want to alarm anybody by thinking that that they've heard <laughs> me say that's going on because probably it's not but it, uh, it would be the kind of thing that would curl your hair <laughs> okay all right, let's talk uh, first about biodiversity, if you will. And I don't even know what the right questions are to ask. So if you were giving a course, uh, Biodiversity 101, uh, to people living in Canada and were trying to explain to us what we need to be worried about, what are the concerns and issues that you think are problematic now that we really uh, should be paying more attention to? Oh, it's such a, a long list, unfortunately, Met. Uh, there's um, three levels of biodiversity, genes, species, and ecosystems. Um, we're losing a lot of genetic diversity of our food 
uh, crop plants of seeds. That's that's a huge concern, and uh, and species are are we have lots and lots of endangered species. Um, populations of of many species have crashed. Uh, our our native bats. Um, uh, anything that eats aerial insectivore, uh, aerial that eats insects, we call them aerial insectivores, um, because the insect populations have been going down so much. Um, the things that feed on them, the next level in the food chain, uh, swallows and swifts and bats and whippoorwills, those are those are at risk now, um, and lots of mammals just because of loss of habitat. Um, and that gets you, the habitat really brings you to the ecosystem level where um, many of our most prized, beautiful ecosystems like the temperate old growth rainforest of British Columbia um, have virtually all been logged and, and, and people are heroically, you know, climbing trees and chaining themselves and trying to save the last few remaining stands of old growth forests and and they're concerned there's still some in Ontario and other provinces but British Columbia seems to be the focus of concern about ecosystem loss and then there are the grasslands there are native grasslands they're, they've all been plowed up and and wetlands the list just goes on and on um, unfortunately um, so that would be part of a biodiversity 101 but with my background at the international level, what I find very few Canadians know is that there is a sister treaty to the Climate Change Convention called the Convention on Biological Diversity that came out of the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. So we have a, a global treaty to save Mother Earth as well as a treaty to combat climate change. And um, that um, treaty there's going to be a really important meeting starting next month in China, actually, Kunming, China, uh, where the parties, um, which is just about every country in the world, except for the U.S., never joined the Biodiversity Convention. But all the other parties are, well, and the U.S. will be there. They will be developing a, what they call a post-2020 global biodiversity framework, setting what are the the targets that all countries of the world agree on for how to deal with this crisis of, of loss of species, uh, genes, ecosystems. Um, so that's a, a pretty key meeting and it's so low profile that, that very few Canadians know about it. And, and even more ironic is that the United Nations Secretariat for that convention is located in Montreal. Some very, very fine, dedicated people working there. And they're the ones who are organizing this um, meeting that starts at the end of um, April in, in China. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you certainly glad you mentioned it because I had never heard of it. And of course, I also didn't know there was such a thing as this convention or, or treaty that had already been negotiated. Is it an adequate treaty? And if so, how come we don't all know about it? And would you say that there are people who should know about it who don't and who are not ad adhering to it because they don't even know it exists? Yeah, so for sure, that's that's part of the issue. And I guess treaties are only as good as the parties to the treaties. So the countries that have joined and signed, which is essentially ever and ratified, all the countries of the world, except the United States, they have it's it, to agree on what needs to be done. And then they have to go home and say, this is what we've agreed to. And here's how we're going to do it. And in Canada, because so much of the land base is uh, in provincial um, mandate or whatever, uh, you know, the, there's not much federal land, there's, but there are huge tracts of what they call provincial crown land. Um, so then it means that the provinces have to also work with the federal government in Canada um, and so you've got the least common denominator at the global level where one country can say, um, for example, if you try to ban uh, uh, trawling, a bottom dredging of the, of the seafloor, which is a hugely destructive practice, and, and particularly if you want to do that in the high seas outside the 
200 mile limit. One country like, well, it could be, I won't name any names, but with an offshore fishing fleet can just say, no, um, we want to protect our industrial interests. So it doesn't happen. And then, but, but then something emerges from, from each meeting and, and, but then it comes back to Canada and then you have to persuade every province that, you know, we're going to take action on a marine issue or a, mm-hmm. or a forest issue because the forests are in provincial jurisdiction. Natural resources is a matter for provincial jurisdiction. So biodiversity is incredibly challenging right around the world, but especially in Canada where we have this um, federated um, political system and the provinces have so much power over um, natural resources, agriculture, forestry, well, are there are some of the provinces I I I would you know I can, can speculate about which ones are cooperative and which ones are not, but let, let me let me not guess. Uh, are <laughs> there is there much uh, variation in in the cooperativeness of the various Canadian provinces? Yeah, and it varies over time. Um, um, like. Uh, a, a province like Ontario will create a, a, a fair number of protected areas, for example. And that's what people immediately think of when they think of biodiversity. Well, let's let's save some land and keep, mm-hmm. keep it from, safe from industrial exploitation and mining and, and so dams and all that. So there's progress, but then a new government comes in. And that's happened in Ontario, it's happened in Alberta. And then progress in terms of, we know that there are more areas that deserve protection, that need protection, it just stops. Mm -hmm. You get a government in. And then often um, governments like to uh, announce new protected areas just before an election because it's a popular thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, or so there's very little activity for, three or four years and then uh, elections coming up. So let's announce that we've set aside some lands and, and uh, created new parks because the demand, the recreational demand for, for parks and protected areas just keeps growing. It's outpacing even population growth because of the pandemic. In my view, people really um, have, uh, well, campground reservations in Ontario have just, skyrocketed it's very hard to get a campsite in many parks parks now when they open up the reservation system which they just did a week or two ago they, it gets flooded and all the campsites disappear immediately so we've got a shortage of places where people can enjoy nature and and, and put their trailer or their or set up a tent and, and and spend some time in nature and that's so important for our physical and mental well-being it is, but uh, it is is it a risk to biodiversity? Oh. If I went out and pitched a tent someplace, I wouldn't know what I'm doing, and I'd probably step all over something precious. Um, you need a management plan for any protected area that divides it up into areas where you allow some human activity, like camping, or even hiking can have disturbances. And one of the big controversial things now are mountain bikes, because if you get mountain bikes running all through a, 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 even a municipal park, it, it's it's problematic. It can just have negative impacts on the indigenous vegetation and 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 bird nesting and and really important things that you want to have happen. You want somehow humans and nature have to reconnect and reestablish our relationship to nature. We, we tend to think we're more and more urban um, species, human beings. And we think of nature as being out there, something separate from us, but it's, it's not, it never has been, it never will be. But having that attitude is a huge part of the uh, environmental crisis that we are having today. Mm -hmm. Um, And indigenous people in North America in particular um, never really had that kind of separation between their communities and the natural world. And somehow we've got to become more indigenous almost and, and, and find ways to bring nature back into the places where people live, into our cities. And, um, 
and make it just more accessible for everyone. You know, I have a couple of uh, things that, that I, I don't know what to call them, but they're my hobby horse. They're, they're a couple of causes that I think nobody else is much onto yet. Uh, well, they're, they're related. One is lawns. Um, I am really concerned about increasing the, the amount of forestry uh, on the planet. And I don't think that the way to do it is try to put, you know, trees on top of a mountain someplace where nobody's going to be able to go and water them or weed them or take care of them for a while. And I, I, I think that we need to put them in the cities. So I would like for everybody to, you know, take up those stupid lawns and put in very dense uh, forests. Uh, I would love uh, Miyawaki forestry methods to be imported to Canada. And, and so we should have lots and lots of forests. I understand that in North America, there's more lawns than there, uh, more acreage in lawns than in the most popular crop, which is corn. So if we just turn our lawns into little forests, uh, it would be a blessing. Now, the other thing is that I understand that five or 10 years, nobody's going to want to own a car because we, uh, we will have electric uh, taxis that are driverless and they'll be so much cheaper than maintaining a car that nobody's going to, we would save about $5,000 a year per family by, by just taking taxis wherever we want to go. And so that means that we don't need garages and we don't need parking spaces on the streets and we don't need parking lots in front of stores. We don't need any of those things because we won't, uh, these taxis will just drop us off where we want to go and they don't park. They just go to the next place. So the streets will be full, but there'll be lots and lots of parking lots. And I want to, I want to make sure that everybody gets to their city council and lobbies them to require that at least half uh, of the spaces saved when we uh, give up all these par parking spaces that we don't need, that they should be devoted to planting trees in the city. Now, am I wrong? You are so right, Meta. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm so tickled. I mean, you've even heard of the Miyawaki planting method, which is uh, something that would I recently learned about from my good friend, Leslie Adams. And, uh, um, and when you're talking about not planting trees up on hillsides, but planting them in the city where people can enjoy and benefit from them. Yes, absolutely. The government committed to 2 billion trees and um, our uh, conservation committee, but the CR club has written the government saying, put as many in the cities and don't just plant trees, but create forests, allow the leaves to, to naturally decompose in place. And, and you'll bring back all the, um, the complex web of life that, that decomposes leaves and the fungi that connect the different trees. Um, and if you're interested in storing carbon, more carbon is actually stored in the soil than in the uh, above ground parts of trees. So, so that's, the, that's what we need to do. And, and in terms of, yeah, remove streets, take, take up whole streets, take out, take out the concrete or asphalt and, and restore nature. And it's just barely starting to happen. And then I was listening to CBC, um, their business show, Paul Haversrude, and he was talking about what Edmonton has, has done to remove parking requirements from their zoning. So now you can build houses and you don't have to have parking associated with it. What a simple little step. And, and most cities in Canada now, they're, they have good transit systems and, and shops within walking distance. You don't need a car. And, um, and another thing in, in Edmonton that they've done is allow somewhat more, you know, more duplexes and triplexes and multifamily dwellings. Um, and people tend to resist that. They say, oh, no, we want our single detached family home. And that's, that's what we're all used to. But in Edmonton, people have really turned 
away from that. And they said, no, it's good. We're, we're seeing younger families move in. There are more children. Um, it's, it's making a, a more diverse and inclusive neighborhood by, by just changing those zoning things. So what can, uh, is done at the municipal level is so important for biodiversity, for social justice and equity. There's a lot. And, but I'd like to see the federal government also sort of recognize those, those connections. And particularly when it's talking about things like planting 2 billion trees or creating urban national parks. That's a commitment that's in the Minister of Environment, Stephen Gibo's mandate letter to create I urban don't know about that. national what parks. Uh, urban national parks. What, what I, that's a new idea for me. What is that? Well, there's one in Toronto. There's one in the Rouge um, oh. uh, Valley. That's the very first one. And okay. it happened, I think there was um, supposed to be a new airport or something. So there was a lot of land that had been set aside. And you don't need another airport oh, in Toronto. The, the Pickering Airport? That mm, it might have been. They were going to, this was 45 years ago or 50 years ago. They were going to put in an airport out. It near the Rouge Valley, but I, I, I you know, I don't know. That but must I, be it then. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> it would be a, a second airport as big maybe as as the uh, Pearson Airport, but um, they're not going to do it now. Good. No, no, it's a national park. And it's the very first one. It's, and, and you've got a, a, a very um, capable and dedicated federal agency called Parks Canada that, that's in charge of it. So now Parks Canada really needs to gear up and, and put these in other cities. And actually Edmonton is, is one of the leading candidates now. Not only are they ahead of the game in terms of zoning, but they're also, I think, in line to be maybe the next, the second uh, urban national park in Canada. But, but there, there's scope to do it in just about every Canadian city. There's, there, there are these chunks of land that, that aren't being uh, used um, for something else, and, and they should be devoted to nature and, and made it uh, and with a planning so that people can enjoy and access them. And it's, it's difficult because you want to preserve some biodiversity and you want to have indigenous native plants, but you also you want to allow people to, to enjoy and use the area. Mm -hmm. Well, another thought that uh, came up in my conversation, I did a talk show with Sandy Smith, who's uh, a, a professor of forestry. Bra. Forestry, yeah. And she does urban forestry, which urban to her includes the periphery of urban res, you know, districts so that the Rouge Valley would be part of, would be urban in her point of view. I, I always thought of it as, as rural, but no. And the, the thing is that there are so many roads. If you, you know, look at the map of Ontario, for example, all these country roads, we could be planting trees along the sides of the roads. And that way it'd be close enough so that when people need to go and take care of those trees, and as I understand it, most trees, you know, they, they have a high mortality rate. And unless you actually take care of them a, a couple of years, they don't do too well. But live if you're going to take care of them, you have to have them planted where people are and people could go to these country roads and, and, uh, you know, take care of them. Um, how about that? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a hard life to be an urban street tree. <laughs> and uh, uh, we used to have a, an urban far citizens committee in, in Ottawa and I co-chaired it for a while. So, uh, it, you know, when you see these, and you still see this, uh, trees in about a, a two meter by two meter little, mm -hmm. or even one meter by one meter hole in the sidewalk, you know, those, that's just not gonna, it's a, it's a sad thing in a way. Um, but when you get out of the city along uh, rural roads, yes, absolutely. And you want the shade and you want the wind breaks and you want, you know, it's, it's it's aesthetics it's it but it it provides humans with a lot of benefits and and uh, i mean another movement that i'm keen on is 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 more bicycling and, and getting people you know to use their bicycles more and it's really catching on and and having a tree lined uh 
route is, makes such a difference if you're on a bicycle. It breaks the wind and, and provides some shade on really hot days. Oh, that's, that's a lovely thought. Now, one thing that came up in a, a, an article that I read <clears throat> about Lyon, France, they, they've uh, replaced a lot of their trees. And I guess the issue is, on the one hand, you want indigenous trees. Uh, you don't want alien species coming in and invading. And on the other hand, <clears throat> uh, you have to plan for the future. And with global warming, you know that a lot of the trees that used to live comfortably in an area are not going to survive there anymore. And you're going to have to use some other kinds of uh, uh, imported trees from, so I think they're bringing in trees from North Africa. Is this something that people are taking into account? And how do you plan for what kinds of trees to plant when, you know, you don't want to necessarily just pin your hopes that your local trees are going to be able to survive? There's a technical term, assisted migration, that um, this has been debated quite a bit. How much should we be ex trying to expand the ranges of, of, of trees, say, um, in the Northern Hemisphere, moving them further north because we know it's, it's warming? And frankly, um, Indigenous people have been doing this for millennia, uh, planting fruit and nut trees, moving them, uh, you know, trying them out in new areas. So, um, you know, again, it's it's not it's humans and nature. We're part of it. So, yes, we should be make doing experiments and uh, planning by moving. And it, I don't know about the case of Lyon, whether it's good to move no, North African species into France, but it, it might well be. But but. Um, there's certainly work to be done in, in, in Canada. Um, in our area around Ottawa, I'd like to see more uh, white oaks because we're right at the northern edge of the range of, of white oak. It's a, a wonderful tree. It's got huge value for um, biodiversity, insects and birds. And, and um, it's also easy to establish. Like uh, this past fall was a, a bumper crop of red oak acorns and they they were landing on our swimming pool cover i wish i didn't have a swimming pool but it it so i just raked up a whole lot of red oak acorns and went around the neighborhood and some of the uh, public lands that are sort of underutilized and just stuck in red oak acorns it's so easy everybody could do that and that's a the cheapest and easiest way of, of, of establishing urban forest is just to plant um, and we have bur oaks and white oaks as well as red oaks in, in Ottawa. You mean the landscapers looking after these parks are not necessarily going to come along and chop down your red oak sapling? Well, I sort of stick them along the edges of where there's already some, some forest. And, uh -huh. or, you know, so they may or they may not. I don't know. Uh -huh. um, but what I think there should be is a sort of national call for all of the cities to plan for expanding their urban forests. Mm -hmm. Just look at your land base, look at where you've got like a playing field that isn't being used or a schoolyard that uh, could use some trees or, or in Ottawa, it's, it's federal properties that aren't that have been ab abandoned basically because, you know, civil servants are working at home or, or whatever. And, um, and uh, make a plan and, and figure out where are your priorities for forest creation. Well, there's another issue that's bugged me for a year or two, and that is um, trees in the far North and how far North and, and is the boreal forest, uh, well, I've heard it said that the boreal forest is actually a, um, a source of, of carbon now, not a sink. And that planting trees in areas of permafrost is problematic. And that certainly planting trees in the uh, far Arctic, Arctic is uh, problematic. I'm, I'm uh, going to be doing a talk show with a guy who has a book called Tree, Tree Line, I think. It mm. writes beautifully. 
but he's gone around the world uh, at the uh, Arctic zones, looking at uh, places where trees are encroaching, and they warm the they warm the soil. So, uh, tell me what um, what I need to know to solve this question because. I haven't heard anything that settles the question in my own mind. Our north, our Arctic subarctic is so vast that, that planting trees there would just be sort of absurd. Um, certainly there are expansions northward of tree line now. The permafrost is melting. There's nothing we can do about that in the, in the near term, and it's going to continue because so much climate change is locked in. And um, some of that permafrost underlays black spruce forest, and you get, uh, when it melts, sometimes the forests just collapse and become wetlands. The, the trees can't stand when the permafrost melts, and you get what's called a... a hmm? I've, seen, I've seen them referred to as drunken trees. They go Tilt That's it. They fall. Drunken trees, drunken forests. So, so I'm probably more concerned about um, the prairie uh, boreal forest um, in uh, ecotone, where where they abut each other, and and the fact that we're the boreal forest is becoming a source of carbon, mostly because of of insect and fire um, problems. We have the mountain pine beetle out west, which which destroyed a huge areas of, of lodgepole pine in British Columbia, and it also affects white bark pine and other really important species. And then those forests, as we saw this summer, are vulnerable to um, fire. You've got standing dead trees, just ideal if a, there's a lightning strike or or human, uh, you know, just throw a cigarette out your car. Um, so it was a very bad fire year in, in again this year, and we've had a number of them in the recent times. Um, so forest fire incidents is really increasing. And if you, the lodge pole pine, the, the jack pine, the black spruce, those are adapted to fire. And if the fire occurs when they already have cones, the and the the tree may burn up, but the heat of the fire opens the cones. They shed the seeds, and the the burned on ground is actually a good place for the new pines and spruces to germinate. But that's only that only works if they if there's been like twenty years between one fire and the next fire. But if it's less than that, there won't be cones there won't be seeds so something else has to occupy and it's usually things with really light wind-blown seeds like poplar or birch or or maybe further north willow um so um yeah i think we're losing our, our forest used to be a major carbon sink but they become a, a carbon source because of these this perverse feedback between global warming and, and insect attacks and, and higher incidence of fire. It's, it's a real problem for Canada. Well, is there anything that can be done about it? I mean, I can't, my mind goes blank. <laughs> uh, this is where we have to get serious about cutting fossil fuel subsidies, um, not building pipelines, getting out of our cars, um, you know, creating urban spaces that don't require people to drive, all, all that, you know, it, it's, the, it's the interaction between climate change and biodiversity. And it was always frustrating when I was um, working at um, Environment Canada on the International Biodiversity File that that we were the poor cousin of the of the Climate Change Convention and and we always it was so obvious that we needed those two conventions to work as one basically that action to combat climate change was action to conserve biodiversity um, conserving biodiversity wetlands and forests is is one of the best ways to combat climate change and yet it was 
we worked in silos. Um, we had very little interaction and it's gotten a little bit better. The people that tell me since I retired in 2012, that those two conventions, which came out of the Rio Earth Summit for heaven's sake. But um, yeah, there's still far too little um, that kind of ecological thinking. It's, it's almost it's hard to be an ecologist meta. It's, it's like they used to say economics is the dismal science, but no, it's, it's ecology these days. <laughs> that's, that's such a bad, okay, let's change the subject. <laughs> it's, it's too depressing to pursue this one. Oh, so, oh well, planting so trees a, isn't depressing, no meta. No, no, that's true. Uh, I, and by the way, I have another uh, crazy idea that uh, I, 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 I can't let the opportunity pass to try it out on you. Uh, and that, as you mentioned, these uh, these trees in the Rockies, you know, that with the pine beetle. And I drove through there about 10, 15 years ago um, and just saw hundreds of miles of red trees, you know, in mm. the mountains. And it was so discouraging that, but I got, at the time, I got very interested in biochar. And my, my solution... I, I don't know it's a solution, but my my effort would be dig dig some trenches and put up those systems where there are no roads, but you can put up ropes like for ski poles. As you know, you can tr travel trees and along or people along ropes from mm. a tower to the bottom and the top of the mountain. So you put these up different places so that people can go up there and cut these trees and then just dig a hole, a trench where they are and put them in there and make your biochar and either just leave it there. Or if you really want to get creative, take it out and, you know, sell it to try to get farmers to mix it in with their fertilizer. But, you know, even if you don't do that, if you just leave it there it's going to sequester carbon. And I'm thinking of that as sufficient to almost maybe offset the terrible damage that's being done by the tar sands. So if Canada just did that as a, an act of gift to the world, it would be something that would remove a tremendous amount of, of carbon that's going to go, it's, it's still locked up in those trees, but it's going to go back into the atmosphere as soon as they start to rot. And we could sequester it in the soil. Yeah, I, I'm very keen on biochar as well. Uh, and again, it's been discussed quite a bit in the Convention on Biological Diversity world as um, because we got into things like um, stratospheric air, um, you know, putting sulfur into the atmosphere to block the sunlight. And then we decide that's a terrible idea for a whole bunch of reasons, but biochar is, has merits and it could be used right as part of forestry. You could um, actually add biochar when you're planting seedlings because it's beneficial for the fungi that um, um, mm. are so important to seedling establishment. So uh, yeah, I, there's a real opportunity, I think, to build uh, biochar management into forest uh, forestry uh, more broadly. It's simply not getting discussed, but but you're on to something there, definitely. Hmm. Okay, well, now you've given me a new idea. I'll play with that one. That's, that's good. I didn't know that, that it could be something that would be valuable to add to the soil when you plant. And that's useful, huh? Okay. Hmm. There's no market for it now. Nobody, I was going to buy some for a friend of mine who had, a, she was going to give up on her garden this year because it wasn't doing very well. So I said, I'll buy you some biochar. So I shopped all the entire Toronto area. You cannot find a single bag of biochar. I had to order it from upper New York state to bring it in, to give her a bag of biochar. That mm -hmm. just shows that we need, we need to do something to create a market for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, look, I've already wasted a lot of time with my own ideas, and but I, I can't help it. I just, I have these 
things that I want to try out on somebody who really knows something. So thank you for that. Now, let's turn to the other main concern, which is really why I contacted you, uh, because you know a lot about what goes on in terms of radiological risks. Uh, What is on your mind in terms of the current uh, dangers of the world uh, that we have to protect ourselves from um, radioactive contamination? The nuclear industry really started as the nuclear weapons industry. I think most people are sort of aware that it came out of World War II and um, maybe Canada's history of involvement in nuclear weapons is not as well known as it should be, but it started in Chalk River, which is just a few kilometers from where I am right now. And um, back in 1944, um, well, Roosevelt and Churchill and got together and said, we need to work together on nuclear weapons because we think the the, our enemies are doing that as well. And uh, they thought they needed a place to do research and Canada looked like a safer place than say the UK. So, um, uh, and then C.D. Howe, who was sort of the minister of everything in, in the Mackenzie King government got involved and went to a meeting in Washington. They all agreed that yes, we'll build a, a reactor in Canada to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. And that was Chalk River, that was the NRX reactor. Um, And uh, C.D. Howe got very excited about this. He said, you know, it's not just gonna be nuclear weapons, it's gonna be nuclear power. It may be, uh, have some medical benefits as well. So um, this place, Chalk River Laboratories grew and grew into a, um, uh, you know, 3,000 people working there. ACL was a, a huge enterprise, but it was still that kind of wartime go, go, go. You know, let's, let's not worry about the wastes right now because, you know, we, there were, there, we've got a mission. First, the mission was to help the Americans build their nuclear weapons and keep up with the Russians in the Cold War. And then the mission was, let's design some nuclear reactors and and make energy cheaply and affordably. And it was a, that was a kind of noble thing. But unfortunately, we now know that nuclear power isn't really cheap. It's, It's when you take in the risks of uh, that we've seen with the Chernobyls and Fukushima's and Three Mile Islands. And there was a meltdown at Chalk River in the first reactor, the NRX reactor, the first major reactor there. So when you when you have to design them to, to deal with those risks, it becomes a very expensive form of uh, energy, a way of making electricity, of boiling water, basically. So now that we have technologies like um, solar uh, um, panels and, and wind turbines. It just doesn't make sense. The nuclear is a um, declining, it's a sunset industry. But Canada, because of our history of being, you know, the founders, originators of much of this and um, designing one of the first major reactors, the Candu reactor, we, we just are clinging to this industry and we don't want to let go. Um, and people still come up with, let's try, let's try this instead of having fuel rods, which let's dissolve the and have it all in solution. And it's been tried before. And they keep trotting out old things that have been tried that, that really didn't work very well and think something, something is going to rescue this nuclear power industry. And in, in the meantime, we forget that we've piled up all this waste at Chalk River and uh, other locations as well. And, and that our power reactors in Southern Ontario are, are generating huge amounts of, of spent fuel waste that we don't really have a good way of dealing with. Mm-hmm. So, in, but the industry doesn't want to talk about the waste. They don't want to talk about the legacy that's going to be passed on to future generations, not just the spent fuel rods, but the reactors themselves. Who's going to dismantle them and take them apart so you don't have these radioactive hulks dotting the landscape? Mm-hmm. Um, so this is what Gordon Edwards says, you know, we're really 
into the era of nuclear waste when it comes to this and and we have to have to deal with it in a in a public way and and not just keep hiding it um i i i tell people it's it's like chalk river was sort of a playpen for the nuclear physicists and the nuclear engineers and they never cleaned up their playpen they, they just kept putting more and more stuff and broken toys and stuff and now they just sort of want to sweep them over into a corner but in a very irresponsible way, just basically create a, a large landfill and, and, and dump all this stuff on the surface. And that's not the way you deal with nuclear waste because, you know, th there'd be all this contaminated metal and, you know, who's going to be looking after it 300 years from now. And people might say, wow, what's this big mound here? Let's dig into it. Oh, look at all this copper. Well, unfortunately that copper is probably contaminated with radioactive substances and, and you can't really recycle the metal from a reactor because it's contaminated. Um, so the, this is a problem that we're only we're trying to get our group and other groups many other groups are really trying to get the government to to actually address there's going to be an auditor general study coming out the standing committee on environment sustainable development is just winding up um, a study of nuclear waste governance um the um, International Atomic Energy Agency back in 2019 said, Canada, you need to have a policy and strategy for dealing with nuclear waste. You don't have one right now. So, so right now we're also having um, a public, we've got a draft, a uh, new, new nuclear waste policy draft that people are commenting on. So it's there, there's a lot going on, but the nuclear industry is, is still so powerful and they're pushing back and, and they want the weakest possible draft. They, they've been stacking the, the witnesses at the standing committee with, with nuclear proponents. And instead of talking about waste, they talk about, oh, let's, let's build new reactors. We've got these little designs that look good on paper. So right now, I, I, we need a public debate and but we need to get the facts and, and, and stop just letting the, the sales people, which I call scam artists, um, dominate the, the discussion. And uh, unfortunately, too many politicians are, are being taken in by these scam artists. Mm -hmm. You know, I did a, a conversation with Gregory Yachko, who used to be the nuclear mm. regulatory czar or whatever you call them in the U.S. under Obama. And after he left that position, he wrote a book, I can't remember the title, but the basic idea was that, oh, it was something like Confessions of a, of a Nuclear Regulator. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, or something. And he, uh, his point was that he, and in the book, I read it, his point was that he couldn't regulate these guys because the lobbyists had so much political power they had more power than he did. And so they were, he was in Washington and they were, you know, they were, they would win every time. So basically his conclusion was I couldn't regulate them and nobody can regulate them and they're not safe. And we, we don't, we, we got to get rid of them. The other thing is most recently he, and I think maybe three other former nuclear regulatory people in Europe, I can't remember who they were, mm. Uh, came together and put out a statement or a letter or something saying that nuclear power is not the answer to to global warming. And, and I think that is probably the, the position that is now getting the most currency. You know, people talk about we, we have to have nuclear power because we can't shift over quickly enough to uh, sustainable, uh, safe forms of of energy, uh, solar and, and wind and so on. It's, it's not going to happen fast enough and the storage isn't good enough. And so mm -hmm. we have to have all these nuclear things and their, their position is this is, this is not correct. Um, it's the opposite. Yeah. It's that nuclear power is way too slow and way too expensive. And there's a, 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 a really a great scientist, a friend of mine, M.V. Ramana at the University of British Columbia, who I consider to be almost. I've done interviews with him, too. He's a friend. <laughs> yeah, he's a, like 
a world authority on, mm. on the issues of um, whether nuclear power can address climate change. And he also gets into the waste issues as well. And uh, he appeared before the standing committee quite recently. So um, the science is, is so clear on this, that nuclear is not a climate solution and can't be and it's a, a dangerous distraction it's because because of the waste issues the cost issues the proliferation issues and the safety issues mm -hmm. um, well there's another issue too and that is reprocessing maybe you can explain what that is because uh, i've also been a, a friend is uh, Fra frank von hippel Mm -hmm. uh, and he had a he, he has co-authored a book, uh, really about the dangers of reprocessing, and I don't I wouldn't be able to explain <laughs> to anybody how what that is exactly. Can can you explain it so that any anybody could understand it? And I'll try. There's uh, two. Uh, isotopes. <laughs> well, you almost have to say what an isotope, but two forms of one of uranium. And a two of uranium actually and one of plutonium. So three that, that are uh, fissile, that if you put enough of them together, you can use them to make a bomb or you can make a reactor. Um, U-235, U-233, and, and um, plutonium-239. So, um, but plutonium-239 and U-233 do not occur in nature. Only U-235 occurs in nature. So if you have a reactor, like a can-do reactor with U-235, the the um, there's also U-238 and the neutrons are flying around and 238 plus one makes 239. So one neutron stuck onto a U-238 atom turn in, and you have some other reactions in there. You get a lot of plutonium-239 in the, in the fuel from a reactor. And if you were to extract that, it can be used to fuel reactors or make bombs as well. So that's the whole idea that maybe we don't have enough uranium. Uh, so we need to extend our supplies of uranium by turning some of that uranium into plutonium. And, um, and isn't that great? But no, it's not because it's such a dirty, messy, business. They did a lot of that in the early days of Chalk River. That's what Chalk River was all about. It was about extracting plutonium from that irradiated U-238 um, and sending it down to the states to make bombs. But you could also, and countries have said, well, let's make uh, reactor fuel out of it. Or, and um, just about every country that's got reprocessing is saying, whoa, this is just, we've got we're not running out of uranium anytime soon. It's a dirty, messy business. It creates a lot of waste uh, reprocessing. But unfortunately, some of those scam artists I was talking about are, are here in Canada and they're saying, oh, you know, we just discovered this great new way to extract plutonium from spent uh, uranium, irradiated uranium fuel. And, and we're going to we're going to do this. And they've actually persuaded both the federal government and the government of New Brunswick to give them some money. It's, it's a scandal, really. Hmm. Well, is that is this thing that call they're calling small modular reactors? Do they use uh, reprocessed uh, material from other reactors or some? Do some do. Yeah, there there's so many different types. Um, uh, Ramana is the expert on this, but um, yes, definitely uh, that's. Uh, the ones in New Brunswick, both the uh, ARC 100 and the Moltex proposals would, would um, use uh, uh, some extracted plutonium. But, but I mean, they s act like this is going to solve the waste problem, the high level waste problem, but it's ridiculous. It, you're, you know, you're taking maybe 5% of, 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 the, of the waste out and, and trying to turn it into a fuel, but it, it's not really doing anything. It's just making more waste. Well, that's interesting because I have heard one guy whose whole cause in life seems to be promoting the idea that we don't really have a nuclear waste problem. If we would just do reprocessing, we could keep using all of the spent fuel 
uh, over and over again until it's all gone, and and therefore there's nothing to worry about. No, no. And <laughs> I, I think I know who you're talking about. I can't think of his name, but he's he's I, just living Peter in a fantasy Ar world. Meyer, I think, yeah. Yeah, Audensmeyer, Peter Audensmeyer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, it's sort of like a Dr. Seuss book, uh, The Cat and the Hat Came Back, where where this pink stuff just keeps spreading and spreading and spreading. That's what you would end up with if you tried to get into reprocessing, just mm -hmm. more and more area contaminated. And, and in that book, some the tiniest little cat comes and, and something poof and, and it all... Uh, disappears, but uh, I don't think we've got that magic solution for for nuclear waste, unfortunately. Well, in fact, I think um, uh, Frank von Hippel's uh, main concern is that it just creates more stuff in various parts of the world. If you have all these countries going in for reprocessing, it's going to make it that much harder to guard it, so that people who want to get hold of a material for a bomb. Uh, or a dirty bomb uh, would uh, it, it you there are a lot of places that they could go look for it yeah a critical mass of plutonium is like the size of grapefruit or not much bigger than that and and holy mo the, the, just the thought of a plutonium economy is is so scary in terms of terrorists getting a hold of of that material and mm -hmm. it is easy to make a, a cheap bomb unfortunately mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I think some of these uh, concerns may be coming back to life. I mean, a lot of us have been thinking about other matters and haven't been paying attention to this. But it seems to me that Putin's recent threat to, you know, resort to nuclear war uh, if he doesn't get his way in Ukraine uh, may be enough to make people wake up and say, hey, maybe we better do something about some of these things, mm -hmm. but also, you know, the problem of, of how quickly we can make a transition to truly sustainable sources of energy is, I guess, the factor, and even the war is going to affect that, you know, there's going to be a lot more impetus for people to, you know, try to see where they're going to get their gas. I mean, Germany is going to have to get gas someplace and, and uh, it, last night in Biden's uh, State of the Union speech, he was said he was re releasing reserves of, uh, mm -hmm. of petroleum products for energy. And uh, well, then the morning paper said, yeah, but it's not enough to make any difference. So, the, you know, we're having we will have a new dialogue, I think, a uh, new discourse on these uh, topics that maybe we pushed aside because they're coming, you know, the urgency is becoming apparent again. Yeah, I, you're right. And, and I, I don't think of the tiny little silver lining in this very black cloud of the uh, invasion of Ukraine is that it's going to force us to think about uh, oil and the military and the fact that the military uses so much oil. Some of the wars are fought over um, trying to get your hands on oil, a, a world without oil would be a much more peaceful world. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been uh, fascinating and very topical, very relevant to today's concerns. And I want to have another conversation with you further uh, because there, you, you have so many interests that are so, so important today. So thank you very, very much. And I expect we'll stay in touch. I have, I have ideas of things I'd like to do work <laughs> with you on. <laughs> well, thank you, Matt. I enjoyed this immensely. All right. We'll be in touch. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Have a great Bye. day. Project Saves the World produces one of these shows three days a week, sometimes even more. This is episode 418. You can watch them or listen to them as audio podcasts on our website to save the world.ca. Eventually, we even post the transcripts there. When you get to the website, do look around because we have conversations going on there all the time about six global issues, plus potential reforms in governance, economics, and civil society. To find a particular talk show, enter its title or episode number in the search bar or the name of one of the guest speakers. After you've watched or listened, 
Scroll down and share your thoughts about the show with the other viewers. This is a place for dialogue, so please join in. See you there.